Here is Master Bartholomew Cokes, Esquire, takes forth his license to marry Mistress Grace Wellborn. When does he take it forth? Today, the four and twentieth of August, Bartholomew Day. Bartholomew upon Bartholomew, there's the device. <laughs> Well, go thy way, John Littlewit, Proctor John Littlewit, one of the pretty wits of Paul, the little wit of London, so thou art called. Aye, <laughs> win, good morrow, win. Now you look finely indeed, win, this cap does convince. But you would not have worn it, would you? Nor have had it velvet, but of a rough country beaver with a copper band, cutty skin woman of Budro. Oh, sweet win, let me kiss it. And in her fine high shoes, too, like the Spanish lady. Good wind, go a little. I would fain see thee pace, pretty wind. <laughs> By this fine high cap, I could never leave kissing of it. Come indeed, La, you are such a fool. Still. Oh, make half a fool win. You are the other half. Man and wife together make one fool. Was there ever the proctor or doctor indeed in the diocese that ever had the fortune to win him such a win? <laughs> there I am again. I do feel conceits coming upon me more than I am able to turn tongue to. Come hither, win. <laughs> How now, Master Littlewit? Measuring of lips or molding of kisses, which is it? Uh, troth, I am a little taken with my wife's dressing here. Dear Wynne, let Master Winwife kiss you. He comes a-wooing to our mother, Wynne, and maybe our father, perhaps, Wynne. There's no harm in him, Wynne. None in this earth, Master Little Wit. I envy no man my delicates, sir. Oh. <laughs> Alas, you have a wife here that, um, with a garden where they grow still. A wife here with a strawberry breath, cherry lips, apricot cheeks and a soft velvet hand, like a melicotta. <laughs> but my taste, Master Littlewit, tends to a fruit of a later kind, the sober matron, your wife's mother. Aye, we know you are a suitor, sir. Wynne and I both wish you well, but you do not take the right course, Master Winwine. No, Master Littlewit, why? Well, you are not mad enough. How is madness the right course? I say nothing. <laughs> Master, uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, you have a friend, one Master Corliss, comes around here sometimes. Why? He makes no love to her, does he? Not a token worth I ever saw, I assure you, but... What? He's the more madcap of the two. You do not apprehend me. You have a hot coal in your mouth now. You cannot hold. Let me out with it, dear Wynn. I will tell him myself. Oh, do, and take all the thanks, and much good to thy pretty heart, Wynn. Sir. My mother has had her nativity water cast lately by the cutting men of Cow Lane, and they do ensure her that she shall never be happy unless she marries within this said night, and when she does, it must be to a madman, they say. Aye, and it must be a gentleman madman. But does she believe them? Yes, and has been at Bedlam twice every day since <laughs> to inquire if any madman be there or to come there mad. Why, this is a confederacy, a mere piece of practice upon her by these impostors. I tell her so, or else say I that they mean some young, madcap gentleman. And therefore would I advise you to be a little madder than Master Coral is hereafter. Where is she? Stirring yet? Oh, stirring, yes, and studying an old elder come from Banbury, a suitor that puts in around mealtime, says a grace as long as the breath lasts him. Sometimes the spirit gets so strong within him that it gets quite out of him, and then when my mother fain to fetch it again with a glass of mom's or aqua calestis. Yes, we have such a tedious life with him. He cannot abide my vocation. No, he says that a proctor is a claw of the beast, and that my mother had little lesson committed an abomination and marrying me as so she had done. When came this proselyte? It was some three days since. Oh, sir, have you taken soil here? <laughs> it is well a man may reach you after three hours running yet. What an unmerciful companion art thou to leave thy lodging in such ungentlemanly hours. Ah, oh, Master John Lillowitz, God save you, sir. It was a hot night, this <laughs> was last night, John. Shall we pluck a hair of the same wolf today, Dr. John? 
Do you remember, Master Corlys, what we discoursed on last night? Uh, not I, John, nothing that I either discourse or do. At those times, I forfeit all forgetfulness. No, not concerning when. There she is, sir, dressed exactly as I told you she should be. Hark you, sir, had you forgot? Oh, this head, I shall be aware how I keep your company, John, when I am drunk and you have this dangerous memory. <laughs> Why, sir? Why? See, we were all a little stained last night, <laughs> sprinkled with a cup or two, and I agreed with Dr. John here to come and do somewhat with Wynne. I know not what it was today, and he puts me in mind of it now. He says he was coming to fetch me. But for truth, if you have that fearful quality, John, to remember when you are sober, John, what you promised drunk, John, I shall take heed of you, John. For this once, I am content to wink at you. Where is your wife? Come hither, Wynne. Master Corliss is an honest gentleman, and he is our worshipful good friend. He is Master Winwife's friend as well. Master Winwife comes a wooing to our mother, as I told you before, Win, and maybe our father, perhaps, Win. There is no harm in them, Win. They are both our worshipful good friends. You must not quarrel with Master Corliss, Win. No, we will kiss again and fall in. Them. Yes, do. <laughs> Me. Do you mark that, gentlemen? Pray thee, forbear for my respect somewhat. Wait, day, how respected you are, but come at the sudden. Well, I will forbear, sir, but in faith that thou wouldst leave the exercise of widow hunting once. Alas, I am quite off that scent for now. How so? Put off my brother of Banbury, one that they say is come here and governs all already. Good win, go, and if Master Bartholomew Pope's woman comes for the license, let her speak to me. Well, gentlemen, uh, what say you? What call you the Reverend Elder you told me of, your Banbury man? <laughs> Reverend Busy, sir, and he is more than an elder, he is a prophet, oh, sir. I, I know him. Uh, a baker, is he not? Oh, he was a baker. He has given over his trade. Now he does dream and have visions. I remember that, too. Out of a scruple he took, that in spice conscience. Those cakes you made were served to bridles, maypoles, morrises, and such profane feasts and meetings. His christian name is Zeal of the Land. Yes, sir. Zeal of the Land! Busy! A notable hip hypocritical vermin it is. I know him. I have not to do with him, for he is a fellow of the most arrogant and invincible dullness, I assure you. Who is this? By your leave, gentlemen, Master Litwit, my business is to you. Is this license ready? Oh, here I have it for you in my hand. That is well, nay, never open or read it to me. It is a labor in vain, you know. I am no clerk. Fold it up of your word and give it. Say what you must have for it. Talk of that anon. Now we'll let it all, but Master Potter. I am for no anons, I assure you. Oh, sweet win, uh, send me the little black box within in my study. I quickly, good mistress, I pray you, for I have both eggs on the spit and iron in the fire. Say what you must have, good Master Little Wit. Why, you know the price, Mistress Nuns. I know? I know nothing, I. What tell you me of knowing? Sir, I do not know, and will not know, and scorn to know it. Yet now I think on it, I, I will and do know as well as another. You must have a mark for your thing here and eight pence for the box. I could have saved two pence in that if I'd bought it myself, but here is fourteen shillings for you. Good Lord! <laughs> How long your little wife stays! This is scurvy, idle, foolish, and abominable. With all my heart, I do not like it. Do you hear, Jack Littlewood? What business does thy pretty head think this lady may have that she keeps such a coil with? Uh, do not mistake her, gentlemen. She is her master's both hands, I assure you. What? The boy is boots and mornings, does she? <laughs> Sir, you have a mind to mock her. Do it softly and look the other way. For if she apprehend you flat the once, she will fly you presently. And her name is Wasp, too. A plague on this box, and the pox, too, and on him that made it, and her that went for it, and all that. Should have sought it, sent it, or brought it. Do you see, sir? Nay, good mistress, was. Good master, Horace, turning your teeth, holding your tongue. Do not I know you, your father was apothecary, oh. and sold blisters, and turning your little wife's teeth, too. It will make her spit as fine as she is for all the velvet customers. 
stood on her head, sir. Oh, be civil, Mistress Nobbs. Did I say I have a human not to be civil? How then? Who shall compel me? You? <laughs> to hear is the box now. Why, a pox on your box once again. Let your little wife stay in it if she will. You are an ass. Master Bartholomew Cooks, Esquire. I have a young master. He is now upon his making a marring. The whole care of his well-doing is now mine. His foolish schoolmasters have done nothing but run up and down the country with it to make pudding and cake bread of his tenants and almost spoiled him. He has learned nothing but to see catches. I dare not let him walk alone for fear of learning a vile tunes which he will sing at supper and in the sermon times. If he meet but a carman in the street, he will whistle him and all his tunes over at night in his sleep. He has a head full of bees. <laughs> Gentlemen, you do not know him. He is another manner of peace than you think for. Well, would, it, would it please you drink, Mr. Snobbs? I have not talked so long to be dry, sir. You see no dust or cobwebs come out of my mouth, do you? You would have me gone, would you? Uh, nay, but, but you're in haste even now, Mr. Snobbs. What if I were? So I am still, and yet I will stay, too. Meddle you with your match, your win there. She has as little wit as her husband, it seems. I have others to talk to. Now, we've been but a day and a half in town, gentlemen, it is true. And yesterday in the afternoon we walked London to show the city to the gentlewoman he shall marry, Mistress Grace. But before I shall endure such another half day with him, I shall be drawn through the great pond at home as his uncle Hodgins. Why, we could not meet the heathen thing all day but stayed him. He would name you all the signs over as he went aloud. And where he spied a, a monkey or a parrot, there he was pitched with all the little long coats about him, male and female, no getting him away. Oh, no! Grace, too. Nay, nay, do not look angrily, Numps. I come with my sister and all. I do not come without her. What the mischief? Do you come with her or she with you? Oh, we, we all came to seek you, Numps. To seek me? Why, did you all think I was lost? Or run away with your 14 shillings worth of smallware here? Or that I changed it in the bear for hobby horses? <laughs> it's precious to seek me. Uh, nay, good mistress, Numps. Do you show this creation, though he be exorbitant? Merry in good she justice, mistress. French hood, turning your teeth, and turning your French hood's teeth too. Do you think you are Madame Regent still, Mistress Overdue, when I am in place? No such matter, I assure you. Your reign is out when I am in dame. I am content to be in abeyance, madam, and be governed by you, and so should he if it is well. But it will be expected you should also govern your passions. Will it so forsooth? Good Lord, how sharp you are. With being at Bedlam yesterday. If you know not what belongs to your dignity, I do yet to mine. <gasps> Is that the license, Nuffs? For love's sake, let me see it. I never saw a license. Did you not, sir? Why, you shall not see it then. <laughs> <laughs> if you love me, good Nuffs. Sir, I love you, and yet I do not love you in these fooleries. Set your heart at rest. There's nothing in it but hard words. And what would you see it for? I, I would see the length and breadth of it, that is all. And, and I will see it now, so I will! You shall not see it here. <laughs> then I will look upon the case here and I will see it at home. Why do you, sir? <laughs> a man must give way to him a little in trifles, gentlemen. These are errors, diseases of youth, which he shall find when he comes to judgment and knowledge. Did you ever see a fellow's face more accusing for an ass? Accusing? It confesses him well, without accusing. <laughs> Pity this yonder wench should marry such a coax. Uh, well, uh, I am now for a piece of business more, Nubs. The fair. <gasps> and I. How blessed to live home in the fair! Uh, nay, never fidge up and down, Nubs. And vex yourself. Uh, I am resolute, Bard, in this. I will make no suit of it to you. It was the end of all my journey to show Mistress Grace my fair. Oh. <laughs> I call it my fair because of Bartholomew. My name is Bartholomew. <laughs> and Bartholomew Fair. <laughs> <laughs> a wit is a dangerous thing in this age. <laughs> a pretty little soul, this same Mistress Little Wit. Would I might marry her? So would I. Or anybody else. I might escape you. Numps, I will see it, Numps, it is decreed. Never be melancholy for the matter. Why see it, sir? See it, do see it. Who hinders you? Slaves see it. Oh, the fair, Numps, the fair. Put the fair and all the drums and rattles in it were in your belly for me. They are already in your brain. He that have the means now to travel your head should meet finer sights than any are in the fair. And make a finer voyage of it. See it all, all with cockle shells, pebbles, fine. 
fine wheat straws, and here and there a chicken's feather and a cobweb. God be with you, sir. There is your bean a box, and much good to you. What mean you not? I will not be guilty, I, gentlemen. Oh, brother, you would not let her go and lose her. Oh, who can hold that will away? I'd rather lose her than a fair. You do not know the inconvenience, gentlemen. You persuade to. Know what trouble I have with him in these humours. If he go to the fair, he will buy of everything to a baby there, and household stuff for that, too. If a letter and arm on him didn't grow on, he would lose it in the press. Pray heaven I bring him off with one stone. And he's such a raven after fruit. You will not believe what a coil I had the other day to compound a business between a Catholic pair woman and him. About snatching. It is intolerable, gentlemen. But you must not leave him now to these hazards, no? Nay, he knows too well I will not leave him, and that makes him presume. Well, sir, will you go now? If you have such an itch in your feet, to foot it to the fair, why do you stop? Sir, go. Why will you not go? Oh, nuns, have I brought you about? <laughs> come, sister, come, Mistress Grace. I am resolute, Bart, yet in faith. Oh, truly, I have no such fancy to the fair, nor any ambition to see it. There is none who is bitter of any quality or fashion. <laughs> oh, Lord, you shall pardon me, Mistress Grace. We are enough of ourselves to make it a fashion. And as for qualities, let Nums alone. She will find qualities. What a rogue that her head she has this. I did offer to marry her. Well, I will leave the chase of my widow for today and directly to the fair. These, these flies do not but this hot season engender us excellent creeping sport. A man that has but a scornful ring would think so. Well, John. When uh, you see it is in fashion to go to the fair, we must to the fair too win, you and I. I have an affair in the fair win, a puppet play of mine own devising, say nothing, which I writ for the mistress of the motion, and which you must see when. I would I might, John, but my mother would never consent to such a profane motion, she would call it. <sighs> Todd, we must have a device, a, a dainty one. I have it, when I have it in faith, and it is fine. Long to eat of a pig, sweet wind, in the fair. Do you see? In the heart of the fair, and not at Pie Corner. Your mother will do anything to satisfy your longing wind, you know. Pray thee long presently, and be sick on the sudden. I will go tell her. Play the hypocrite, wind. I can be hypocrite enough, though I were never so Straight late. Oh, you speak truly. You have been bred in the family and brought up to it. Our mother is a most elect hypocrite and has maintained us all this seven year with it like gentlefolk. She is not a wise, willful widow for nothing, nor a sanctified sister for a song. Better, better! <laughs> oh, oh, mmm, mmm, oh. Child, how do you, sweet child, speak to me? Yes, for soon. Look up, sweet, win the fight, and suffer not the enemy to enter you at this door. Remember that your education has been with the purest. What polluted one was it that first named the unclean beast pig to you, child? Oh, oh, oh. oh. Not oh. I, on my sincerity, mother. She longed about three hours ere she should let me know. Uh, who was it, when? A profane black thing with a Fear, John. No, oh, resist it when the fight it is the tempter, the wicked tempter. You will know him by the fleshy motion of pig. Be strong against it and his foul temptations whereby it broaches flesh and blood, as it were, on the weaker side. And pray against his carnal provocations. Good child, sweet child, pray. I pray you, mother, that she might eat of some pig and, and her belly full too. And do not cast away your own child and perhaps one of mine with, with your tail of the tempter. <laughs> oh, Wynn, how do you? Are you not sick? Oh, yes, a great deal, John. Oh, oh, what do we do? Oh. Fetch our zealous brother busy hither for his faithful fortification in this charge of the adversary. Sweet child, you shall eat pig. Be comforted, my sweet child. Oh, yes, mother, and in the fair. I mean in the fair, if it may be in any way made or found lawful. Where's our brother busy? Will he not come? Oh, look 
child. Presently, mother, as soon as he has cleansed his beard, I found him uh, fast by the teeth and a cold turkey pie in the cupboard <laughs> with the great white loaf in his left hand, the glass of Malmsey in his right. Slender not the brethren, wicked one. <laughs> Here he is now, sanctified mother. Oh, brother busy, your health and edify and raise us up in a scruple. My daughter, win the fight, is visited with a natural disease of women <clears throat> called a longing to eat pig. I, sir, our Bartholomew pig, and in the fair. And we will be assured from you, religiously wise, whether a widow of the sanctified assembly and a widow's daughter may commit the act without offense to the weaker sisters. Verily, for the disease of longing, it is a disease, a carnal disease or appetite incident to women. And as it is carnal and incident, it is natural, very natural. Now, now, pig, it is a meat, and a meat that may be longed for, and so, consequently, eaten. Right? It may be eaten, very exceedingly well eaten. Uh, but in the fair, and as a Bartholomew pig, it cannot be eaten, for the very calling it a Bartholomew pig, and to eat it so were a spice of idolatry. Oh. Aye, but in state of necessity. Think to make it as lawful as you can. Yes, and as soon as you can, sir, for you see the danger that my little wife is oh, in, sir. Oh, Truly, oh. I do love my daughter and would not have her miscarry if it might be otherwise. Surely, it may be otherwise. It may be eaten, and in the fair, I take it, in a, in a booth, the tents of the wicked. The place is not much, not very much. We may be religious in midst of the profane. Uh, so it be eaten with a reformed mouth, with sobriety uh, and humbleness, not gorged in with gluttony and greediness. Uh, there is the fear. For should she go there as taking pride in the place, or delight in the unclean dressing, it, it were not well, it were not fit, it were abominable and not good. <laughs> Courage, wind. We will be humble enough. We will seek out the homeliest booth in the fair. Rather than fail, we will eat it on the ground. Why? And I will go with you myself, and our brother Busy as well, for his better consolation. In the way of comfort to the weak, I will go and eat. I will eat exceedingly and prophesy. Oh, there may be good use made of it, too, now I think of it, by the, the public eating of swine's flesh to, pro to profess our hate and loathing of Judaism, uh, whereof the brethren stand taxed. Uh, good, I will eat heartily as well, for I will be no Jew. I could never away with that stiff-necked generation. Truly, I hope my little one will be like me, that longs for pink so in his mother's belly. <laughs> <laughs> By all the world, I am of overdue for a disguise. They may have seen many a fool in the habit of a justice, but never till now. Uh, a justice in the habit of a fool. <laughs> thus, must, that, thus must we do, though, that wait for the public good, for we are but public creatures. What do we know? Nay, what can we know? We see with other men's eyes, we hear with other men's ears. A, a foolish constable or a sleepy watchman is all our information and we, by the vice of ours, must believe them. I, Adam Overdue, am resolved, therefore, to spare spy money hereafter. Many are the yearly enormities of this fair, in whose courts I have sometimes had the honor to sit during the three days. This is the special day, however, for the detection of those four set enormities. Here is my book for the purpose. This, the cloud that hides me, under this covert I shall see and not be seen. And, as I began, so shall I end, in justice name, and the kings, and for the commonwealth. Fairest pestilence, dead, methinks. People come not abroad to 
today, whatever the matter is. Do you hear, Sister Trash, Lady of the Basket? Sit further with your gingerbread progeny and hinder not the prospect of my shop, or I shall have it proclaimed in the fair what stuff they are made on. And what stuff are they made on, Sister Leatherhead? Nothing but what is wholesome, I assure you. Oh, yes. Stale bread, rotten eggs, musty ginger, and dead honey. Oh, I have a met with the Normandy so soon? What do you lack, gentlemen? What do you buy? Rattles, drums, halberds, horses, babies of the best, fiddles of the finest. Buy any pears. Pears fine. Very fine pears. Buy any gingerbread. Gilt gingerbread. Hey, now the pears are filling the birds with food. Yearly with old St. Bart's old punkers, they are waiting, drunkards, chapmen's trading. Who would see the fair without its lady? Ballads, buy any new ballads. Fire upon it! Who would wear out their youth and prime thus in roasting a pig that at any cooler vocation? Ugh, hell is a kind of cool cellar to it. What? Who oh, can? My chair, your false saucer, and my morning's draft. Quickly, a bottle of ale, and quench me, rascal. Well, I'm all fire and fat, Nightingale. I'll even melt away to the first woman. A rib again, I'm sure. I do water the ground in knots as I go, like a great garden pot in Alaska that are Ezekiel here this morning. Ezekiel? What's Ezekiel? Ezekiel Edgeworth, the civil cut purse. You know her well enough. She's a talk's body to you still. I call her my secretary. Uh, she promised to be here this morning, I remember. When she comes, better stay. I'll be back again presently. Uh, best take your morning dew and your belly, Nightingale. Uh, uh, come on, Missy. <laughs> Stay here. And with her moon cap, and, and 
why not wonders of an orgy? By thy leave, goodly woman, and the fatness of the fair, oily as the king's constable's lamp, and uh, shining as his shoey corn, uh, hath thy ale virtue, and, and thy beer strength, that the, the tongue of man may be tickled, and his palate pleased in the morning? Mm. What new roar is this? It is mad Arthur of Bradley that makes the orations. Brave master, old Arthur of Bradley, how do you? Welcome to the fair. When shall we hear you again? Let me drink with my love, thy not here, that I may be eloquent, but of thy best, lest it be bitter in my mouth and my words uh, fall foul upon the fair. Why dost thou not fetch him drink and offer him to sit? Is it ale or, or beer, Master Arthur? My best, pretty stripling, my best. The same thy dove drinketh, and thou drawest on holidays. Bring him a sixpenny bottle of ale. They say a fool pencil is lucky. Bring both ale for Arthur and beer for Bradley. Ale for thy dog, girl. My disguise takes. I shall, by the benefit of this, discover enough and more. What, my little lean Ursula, my she-bear? Are you alive yet, with thy litter of pigs to grunt out another Bartholomew fair? <laughs> yes, and to amble afoot when the fair be done, to hear you groan in a cart up the heavy hill, or cutting haypenny purses, stealing penny dogs out of the fair. Oh, good words, Urs. Another special enormity, a cut purse. You are one of those horse leeches that gave out I was dead in Turnbull Street of a surfeit of bottle ale and tripe. Oh, no, no. It was better meat burst. Cows udders, cows udders come. There is no malice in these fat folks. Hey, let us drink it out, gooders. Thank you, child. Uh, tell me, is this goodly woman before us a, a, a knight of the night? What mean you by that, Master Arthur? A, a child of the horn thumb, a, a babe of booty, a, a cut purse girl. No, Lord, sir, far from it. She is a horse courser, sir. Here might I have been deceived and, and put a fool's blot upon myself. Oh, oh Lassie, this is an ill season for thee. <laughs> Hang yourself, hackney woman. <laughs> Come, a pig's head'll stop your mouth. <laughs> For thee, take thy chair again and keep state. And uh, let us have a fresh bottle of ale and pipe of tobacco. Ah, here's Ezekiel Edgeworth, a fine girl of her inches, as is any in the fair. Oh, fetch some ale and tobacco. What do you like, gentlemen? Buy some gingerbread. Ballads, ballads, fine new ballad, the delicate ballad of the ferret and the coney. Another of Goose Green's darts and the godly garters. What is it you buy, ladies and gentlemen? How about the windmill blown down by the witch's fart? Come <laughs> hither, Mistress Nightingale. Leave your mart a little. Uh, uh, child of the mart. What is she? Uh, what, what's she? A civil young gentlewoman, Master Arthur, that keeps company with the roarers and disperses all still. She has ever money in her purse. She pays for them and endure for her. Pity it is that so simply a young woman should go to the house company. You can see in her countenance, she has a very close look about her. And I warrant her a quick hand. A very quick Ooh. hand, sir. All the purses and purchase I give you today by conveyance bring hither to Ursula's presently. Here we will meet at night in her lodge and share. Look, you choose good places when you sing, Nightingale. Aye, right. and near the fullest passages and shift them often. Aye, and your hawk, you, in your singing, you must use your hawk's eye nimbly and fly the purse to a mark. Hmm? Fair enough. Talk no more of it. Fair fills the face. Company begins to come in. And I have never a pig ready yet. How do the pigs, Moon Cat? Very passionate, mistress. One of them is wiped out in the eye. If I can, with this day's travel and all my policy, but rescue this fine youth here from the hands of the, the lewd women, I will. <laughs> we are here before them. All the better, we will see them come in. What do you want, gentlemen? What is to buy? A, a fine horse, or a, a lion, or a bear, or a bull, or a dog, or a cat, or a nymph's 
instrument, what is to lack? Will you buy any comfortable bread, gentlemen? That these people should be so ignorant, and because Chapman for them. Do we look as if we would buy hobby horses or gingerbread? Why, they know no better where do they have for better customers than come. And our very being here makes us fit to be demanded as well as others. Would cooks would come? There it works for customer for that. Hey, who's yonder? Ned Winwife and Tom Corliss. Hey, Master Winwife! Master Corliss! Will you take a pipe of tobacco with us? Do not see her, she is the roaring horse courser. Pray thee, let us avoid her. Turn down this way. Slut, I will see her. And roar with her too. Pray thee, go with me. Will you sit down, sir? This is old Ursula's mansion. How like you her bower? Here you may have your pig and your punk in state, sir. Both piping hot. I'd rather have my punk cold, madam. <laughs> this is for me. Punk and pig. What? Moon cat? You rogue! Master Winwine, you do not talk, nor drink. Are you proud? Not of the company I am in, madam, <laughs> nor of the place. You do not accept it, the company, do you? Nay, good mistress Knockham, respect my mistress's power. <gasps> Why, you <laughs> thin lame fool! And you! Must you hinder them? What did you know, rascal, if they would have lost a cloak or some such? Must you be drawing the air of pacification here? While I am tormented within in the fire, you weasel! Mistress, it was in the behalf of your booth's credit that I spoke. Of oh, what? Would my booth have broke if they had fallen out at it, Missy? Or would their feet have fired it in, you rogue? And wipe the pigs and take the fire that they fall not, or I will go and base you and roast you till your eyes fall out. Furies, I think. Nay, she is too fat to be a fury. Sure, some walking sow of tallow. An oh. inspired vessel of kitchen stuff. Aye, aye, Jane, sirs. Mark a plain, plump, soft, <laughs> went to the suburbs. <laughs> Do, because she is juicy oh. and wholesome. Oh. You must have your fin pinched wear. Aye, well said, Urs, my good Urs, to them, Urs. Sheer quagmire, Knockham. Is this your bog? We shall have a quarrel presently. How? Bog? Quagmire? Foul vapors? Huh? Yes, huh? he that would venture for it, I assure him, might sink into her and be drowned to a year. Any friend he had could find where he were. And then he would be a fortnight waking up again. It were like falling into a whole shire of butter. They need to be a team of Dutchmen should draw him out. <laughs>
the ball thresher, your sire was scarce warm. Oh, Brady, let us go. No, Faith, I will stay the end of her now. I know she cannot last long. I find by her similes she wanes apace. Oh, does she so? Oh, I will say you gone. Give me my pig pen hither a little. No. My purse is gone. Oh, my purse! Is it a 
Nay, good nouns. It's not my best purse. Not your best? Death, why should it be your worst? Why should it be any indeed at all? Answer me to that. Give me a reason from you why it should be any. Oh, no, my gold, I have that yet. Look, you. <laughs> Here. Why so? There is all the feeling he has. I pray you have better care of that brother. Oh, nay, so I will, sister. And, and I warrant you, let him catch this. That catch can. <laughs> I would fain see him get this, mark you here. So, so, so. Very good. I would have him come again and but offer at it. Sister, will you take notice of a good jest? I will put it just where the other was. Uh -huh. <laughs> and if we be lucky, you shall see a delicate fine trap to catch the cut person that brings me. She'll try you or you be out of the fair. Oh, come, come, Mistress Grace. Prithee, be not melancholy for my mischance, sweetheart. Sorrow will not keep at it. I do not think of it, sir. It, it was but a little scurvy white money. Hang it, it may hang the cup purse one day. <laughs> <laughs> I have gold left to give thee a fairing yet. Hmm? Yet as hard as the world goes, <laughs> nothing angers me but that no one here looks like a cup purse. Unless, <laughs> unless it were not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I look like a cup purse. <laughs> Here is the row, is the bar of the cup purses, whom I will break oh, the oh, oh, no. oh, 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 the one, the great of the cup purse. Share, sir, they say, let them share. Yeah. He will be spectacle enough. I will answer for it. Oh, Christ, Duke Quarrelous, how dost thou? Thou dost not know me, I fear. I am the wisest woman, but justice overdue, and all of Bartholomew fair now. Give me twelve pence from me, and I will help thee to a wife worth forty marks for it. Wait, roll pence away. And she shall show thee as fine cut work for it in her smock, too, as thou canst wish. Wilt thou have her, worshipful windwife? I will help thee to her. Be it here in the pig's quarter, give me thy twelve pence from me. Why, there is twelve pence. Pray thee, wilt thou be gone? Thou art a worthy man and a worshipful man still. Get you gone, master. I do mean it, man, Prince Quarrelous. If thou hast need of me, thou shalt find me here, at Ursula's. I will see that thy ale and punk is ready for thee in the pig's thigh. Bless thy good worship. I'll look where John Littlewood comes. And his wife, and my widow, her mother. The whole family. They're going a feasting. <laughs> what what the schoolmaster is that? That is my rival, I believe, the baker. So uh, walk on in the middle way, for right. But turn neither to the right hand nor to the left. Uh, let not your eye be drawn aside to vanity, nor your ear with noisy. What do you like, gentlemen? What do you find? Or the, the fiddle to make him a reveler. What is he lack? Little dogs for your daughters? Or, or babies, male and female? Look not toward them, bark and not. The place is the grove of hobby horses and trinkets. The wares are the wares of devils. And the whole fair is the shop of Satan. They are hooks and baits, very baits, that are hung out on every side to catch you and hold you, as it were, by the gills, by the nostrils, as the fisher doth. Therefore, you must not look nor turn toward them. Even man could stop his ears with wax against the harlot of the sea. Do you the like with your fingers against the bells of the beast? She's leading his flock into the fair now. Rather driving them to the pens, for he will let them look upon nothing. Gentlewomen, the weather is hot. Whither walk you? Have a care of your fine velvet caps. The fair is dusty. The best pig and bottle ale in the fair, sir. Old Ursula is cook. There you may read. The pig's head speaks it. This is fine, verily. Here be the best pigs, and she does roast them as well as she ever did. The pig's head says. So, were you not warned of the 
vanity of the eye, have you forgotten the wholesome admonition so soon? Good mother, how shall we find a pig if we do not look about for it? Child, run off the spit and into our mouths in lover land and cry, Wee! Wee! <laughs> no, but your modern mother, religiously wise, conceive it that it may offer itself by other means to the sense, as by way of uh, steam, which uh, I think it doth here in this place. Yes, yes it doth, and it were a sin of obstinacy, high and horrible obstinacy, to resist or decline the good titillation of the fainlick sense, which is the smell. Therefore, be bold. Enter the tents of the unclean for once and satisfy your wife's frailty. Uh, let your frail wife be satisfied, your zealous mother, and my suffering self will also be satisfied. <laughs> Come, Win, as good Winnie here, let's go farther and see nothing. We escape so much of the other vanities by our early entry. He's an edifying consideration. This is scurvy, John, that we must come into the fair and not look upon it. Win, have patience, Win, I will tell you more anon. Mooncat, entertain within there, the best pig in the booth, a pork-like pig. These are banberry blood from a pig hunting. Wit, look to your charge. A pig, prepare presently. Let a pig be prepared to us. Slay, who be these? Is this a good service, Jordan, you would do me? Why are thou shalt have vapors, and they like you get presently pretty. Go in. Hang thy vapors. They are stale and stink like you. <laughs> are these the guests of the game you promised to fill my booth with all today? I? What ails they, yours? Ails they? <laughs> they are sippers. <laughs> sippers of the city. <laughs> they look as they would not drink off two penny worth of bottle ale between them. Away. Thou art a fool, Earth, and my moon calf too, and your ignorant vapors now. Hence, good guests. I say, right, hypocrites, good mouth gluttons, in and set a couple of pigs on the board and half a dozen of the biggest bottles before them. Good mouth gluttons, fine family hypocrites, two to a pig, away. <laughs> Are you sure they are such? Of the right breed, thou shalt try them by the teeth, <laughs> Now were a fine time for thee, when wife, to lay aboard thy widow. Thou wilt never be master of a better citizen or place. She that will venture herself into the fair and a pig box will admit any assault. Be assured of that. I love not enterprises of that suddenness, though. You are a modest undertaker. Come, is a disease in thee, not judgment. Look, here is the poor fool again. No, it's flung by the lost. <laughs> I will make no more orations. I shall draw out these tragical conclusions. And I begin to think that by spice of collateral justice, Adam Oberd, you deserve this beating, for it, it, it was the exhortation I had of that young woman I took a fancy to this morning, and have not left it yet, that drew the company, which indeed drew the cut purse, which drew the money, which drew my brother Coase's loss, which drew on Wasp's anger, which drew my beating. <laughs> a pretty gradation. I thought it one uh, special blow she gave me to reveal <laughs> myself, but then I thanked the fortitude. I remembered that a wise man for no particular disaster ought to abandon a public good design. Uh, I will not reveal myself till my due time. Come what may, come beating, come imprisonment, come banishment, nay, come the rack, come the hurdle, welcome all! I will not reveal myself, but all shall be, as I said ever, in justice name, at the king's, and for the commonwealth. What? Does he, does he talk to himself and act so seriously? Poor fool! No matter, here is fresher argument. Come, sister, come, mistress Grace, here be more fine sights together to think. God's live, where is not? What do you like, gentlemen? Where is your by? Find rattles, drums, babies, little dogs and birds for ladies. Nay, good nums, do not mistake. Thou art so apt to mistake. <laughs> I would but watch the goods. Look you now, Mr. Hedgehog was almost like to be lost. Pray you take heed. <laughs> Pray you take heed you lose not yourself. Your best way will even get up and ride for more surety. My tokens were the great pins and fasten yourself to my shoulder. When you last, what is to buy? A fine purses, pouches, pin cases, pipes, or a 
a fine whistling bird. <laughs> Dumps, there would be finer things than any we have bought in the fair. <gasps> and a delicate deal of great horses, too. Good Dumps, stay, look for the goods, and come hither. Will you discourse with her? Why the measles should you stand here cheating of dogs, birds, and babies? You have no children to bestow them on, have you? Well, no, Nums, but, but again, I have children. That is all one. Do, do, do. How many shall you have, thank you? Good Nums, hold that tongue of thine and save it a labor. I am resolute barn, thou knowest. A resolute fool you are, I know, and a very sufficient coxcomb. Nay, with all my heart, you will have it, sir. If you be angry, turn your teeth. Twice, if I said it not once before, and much good do you. Alas, for Carol, when you're to crack her. <laughs> Let us in and comfort her. Would I have been set in the ground and had my brains crushed out when first I underwent this plague of a charge? How now, Nums? Almost tired in your protectorship? Overparted, overparted? Why, I cannot tell, sir. Maybe I am. Does it grieve you? No, I swear, does it not, Nums, to satisfy you? Nums! Spud, you are fine and familiar. How long have we been acquainted, I pray you? Uh, it was this morning, sure. <laughs> Are you removing the fair, Nums? <laughs> a pretty question and a very civil one. Yes, Faith, I have my laden, you see, or shall have a none. You may know whose beast I am by my burden. <laughs> How melancholy Mistress Grace is yonder. Pray thee, let us go enter ourselves in grace with her. Um, six of the horses, friend, I will have. How? And half a dozen birds, and that drum, I have one drum already. No, the shop. Buy the whole shop. It will be best. The shop, the shop. If his worship please. Yes, and keep it during the fair. Jim. Peace, numbs. Friend, do not meddle with her. She will sting you through to your rot nightcap, believe me. Uh, a set of violins I would buy also. I would fain have a nice young mask at my marriage, now that I think of it. But I would like such a number of things, and I dare not ask Nub to help now. She will not help me. Will your worship buy any gingerbread? Very good bread. Comfortable bread. Gingerbread! <laughs> to interrupt my market in the midst and call away my customers? Can you answer for this at the pie powders? <laughs> Why, if his master ship have a mind to buy, I may hope my ware lies so open as another's. I may show my ware as well as you, yours. <laughs> Hold thy feet, I will content thy bowl. I will buy up thy shop and thy basket. Will you in faith? Why should you put it front of friend? Cry you mercy. You would be sold too, would you? What is the price on you? Jerkin and all as you stand. Have you any qualities? Yes, you shall find she has qualities. Is she cheap of her? Good, so you have the selling of her. Well, what are they? Will they be sold for love or money? No, indeed, madam. For what then? Victuals? She scorns victuals, madam. She has bread and butter at home, thanks be to God. <laughs> and yet, she will do more for a good meal. She will play you all the puppets of the town over. All the players, every company, and her own company, too. She spares nobody. In faith, can she set out a mask, too? Oh, Lord, sought you far and near for her inventions. She engrosses all. She makes all the puppets in the fair. <gasps> Dost thou in trouble? Nay, sir, you shall hear her interpret Master Littlewood's motion. Speak no more, but shut up shop presently, friend. I will buy both it and thee to carry down with me. Uh, thy shop shall furnish out the banquet, and yours the mask. Um, uh, what is the cost, at a word, friend, of thy shop and all, case as it stands? <clears throat> Sir, it stands me in six and twenty shillings, seven pence, half penny, plus three shillings for my ground. Ah, uh, well, thirty shillings should do it then. <laughs> and uh, what comes yours to? Three. Four shillings and eleven pence, sir, ground and all, that like your worship. It does like my worship very well, woman. That is five shillings more. <laughs> oh, what a mask I shall shell out for forty shillings. <laughs> and a banquet of gingerbread. That is a stately thing. I am beholden to you, <clears throat> sir, and your Bartholomew wit. <laughs> you do not mean this to you. Is this your purchase? Uh, yes, Numps, and I do not think, but will say it is the wisest act that ever I did in thy wardship. <laughs> like enough, I shall say anything I. Uh, 
my project is how to fetch off this proper young woman from her debauched company. I have followed her all the fair over, but find her still with this songster, and uh, I begin shrewdly to suspect a familiarity and, and the young woman of a terrible taint. Poetry, with which idle disease if she be infected, there is no hope of her in the state boards. Wonder if he's buying his gingerbread, setting quickly before he part with too much of his money. My masters and friends and good people draw near. Ballads! <laughs> Hark, hark, madam, pray thee stay a while. Good numbs, look to the goods. What ballads hast thou? Let me see, let me see myself. Why so, he has flown to another lime bush. There he will flutter till we have never a feather left. Faith, the sister comes after them well, too. Hey, if you saw the justice, her husband, my guardian, he'd be well fitted for this mess. He's such a wise one, his way. I wonder we see him not here. He is too serious for this place, and yet better sport than these three, I assure you, gentlemen, wherever he is, I will be on the bench. How dost thou call it? A caveat against cut purses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a wise jest indeed. <laughs> I would soon see this dame in your cup purse. Uh, they say he walks here about. I would see him walk now. But look here, sister, here, here, let him come. <laughs> Valid woman, does any cup purses haunt here about? Pray thee, raise me one or two, begin and show me. Oh, sir, this is a spell against them. Mm. Spick and span new, and it is made, as it were, in mine own person, and I sing it in mine own defense. Uh. It is intended, sir, as if by chance. By chance, a purse should be cut in my presence now. I may be blameless, as by the sequel more plainly appear. Uh, well, we shall find that in the matter. Pray to begin. To the tune of Paddington's Pound. Um, uh, fa la 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 la. <laughs> Nay, I will put V into. <laughs> pray begin. Sir, you must know, though, it is a gentle admonition, both to the purse cutter and the purse bearer. Not one more word out on the tune if thou lovest me, fa la 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 la. Come when? <laughs> My masters and friends and good people draw near, and look to your purses, for that I do say, and though little money in them you do bear, it costs more to get than to lose in a day. <laughs> Young and the old, and bid and beware of the cut purse so bold. And if you take heed not free me from the curse, we both give you warning for and the cut purse. You, you thou had better been starved by thy nurse than live to be hanged for cutting a purse. Most admirable good is enough. What say you, numps? Is there any harm in this? Have been upbraided to men of my trade that oftentimes we are the cause of this crime. Alack, and for pity, why should it be said as if they regarded or places or time? Examples have been of some that were seen in Westminster Hall, yea, the pleaders between. Then why should the judges be free from this curse more than my poor self for cutting the purse? You, you, thou hadst better been starved by thy nurse, nurse and live to be hanged for cutting a purse. <laughs> well said. Why should the judges be more free indeed? Uh, that bit again, Malin woman, that again. You, you, you thou hadst better been starved by thy nurse and <laughs> live to be hanged for cutting a purse. <laughs> oh, I would fain rub my elbow, but I dare not pull out my hand. Thank you. I'm valid woman. She that wrote this shall be poet to my mask. Speak, nubs, is there any harm in this? To tell you too, it is true good for you, unless you had grace to follow it. It doth discover enormity. I will mark it more. I've not liked a paltry piece of poetry so well a good while. You, you thought better been stopped by that nerd. Woman, 
I do hear of this master youth, the cupbearer, but I cannot see him. Show him to me. Me one without grace at a better place, at court and in Christmas before the king's face. Alack, then for pity must I bear the curse that only belongs to the cunning cut purse. Oh, where is their cunning now when they should use it? They are all chained, I warn you. For God, I would give half the fare for a cut purse for him to save his body. <laughs> sister, sister. Where is it? Which pocket for a wager? Oh! <laughs> Sister, I am an ass, I cannot keep my purse on. On, I pray thee, friend. But oh, you vile nation of cut purses all, relent and repent and amend and be sound, and know that you ought not by honest men's fall, advance your own fortunes to die above ground. Look, there's a cut purse gathers up to him, mark. <laughs> Shall bring on your ending for us, madam. 
We are no catchpoles nor constables. That you are to undertake is this. You saw the woman here with the black box? The governess, sir. That same. I would have you get away that box from her and bring it to us. Will you have the box and all, sir, or only that that is in it? I will get you that and leave her the box to play with still, which will be the harder of the two, because I would gain your worship's good opinion of me. She says, well, it is the greater mastery, and it will make the most sport when it's missed. Aye, and it will be the longer a missing to draw on the sport. But look, you do it now, madam, and keep your word, or we'll- Sir, if ever I break my word with a gentleman, may I never read word of my need again. Where shall I find you? Somewhere in the fair hereabouts. Dispatch it quickly. I would fain see the careful fool deluded. Of all beasts, I love the serious ass. And you would not choose, sir, but to love my guardian, just as overdue, who is answerable to that description in every hair of him. So I've heard, but uh, how came you, Mr. Swellborn, to be his ward? Have you a uh, relation to him? Hey, they're a common calamity. He bought me, sir, and now he will marry me to his wife's brother. That wise gentleman, you see. Or else I must pay value of my land. Slit, is there no device of disparagement or so? You know, talk with some crafty fellow, some picklock of the law. Would I had studied a year longer at the inns of courts if it had been but in your case? My master Corliss, are you proffering? You would bring but little aid, sir. I'll look to you in faith, gangster. An unfortunate, foolish tribe you have fallen into, lady. I wonder you can endure them. Sir, they that cannot work their fetters off must wear them. You see what care they have of you to leave you thus. Faith the same as they have of themselves, sir. I cannot greatly complain if this were all the plea I had against them. It is true, but would you care to withdraw with us for a little and make them think they have lost you? I hope our manners have been such hitherto, and our language, as would give no cause to doubt yourself in our company. Sir, I will give myself no cause. I am so secure in mine own manners as I suspect not yours. Well, Sean Little comes. Away, I will not be seen by him. No, you are not best to it. Tell his mother, the widow. Hart, what do you mean? Of course, is the wind there? Does not the widow be named? When? 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 Do you hear? What say you, John? Well, they are paying the reckoning, when I will tell you a thing, when We shall never see any sights in the fair except you long still, win. Good win, sweet win. Long to see some hobby horses and some drums and some rattles and some dogs and some fine devices, win. The, the bull with the five legs and the great hog. Now you have begun with pig. You may long for anything, Wynne, and so for my motion. But we shall not eat of the bull, John, or the hog. How shall I long then? Oh, yes, but you may long to see as well as to taste, Wynne. Now go in and long. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I think we are rid of our new customers, Sister Leatherhead. We shall hear no more of him. All the better. Let us be gone before he finds us. Stay a little. Yonder comes the company. Sir, I will take your counsel and cut my hair and leave vapors. I see now that bottle ale and tobacco and pig and wit and very Ursula herself is all vanity. Only pig was not commended in my admonition. Uh, the rest were. For the long hair, it's an ensign of pride, a, a banner. And and the world is, is very full of banners, very full of those banners. Now, bottle ale is a, is a drink of Satan's, a diet drink of Satan's devised to, to puff us up and make us swell in this latter age of vanity as, as the smoke of tobacco to keep us in mist and error. Hmm. But the fleshly woman, which you call Ursula, is above all to be avoided, having the marks upon her of the three enemies of man. Uh, the world as being in the fair, uh, the devil as being in the fire, and the flesh as being herself. Oh, good brother Zeal, what shall we do? My daughter, when the fight has fallen into a fit of longing again. For more pig? There's no more, is there? No, to see some sense at the fair. Oh, sister, let her fly the impurity of this place, lest she partake of the pitch thereof. Thou art the seat of the beast, O fair, and I will leave thee. Idolatry peepeth out on every side of thee. Excellent, right hypocrite. 
Now his belly is full. He falls a roll, rambling and a kicking the jade. I will then enjoy Ursula with telling how her pig works. Two and a half he eat to his share, and he has drunk a pailful. <laughs> what do you like, gentlemen? What do you buy? Rattles, drums, bass. Peace with your apocryphal wear! is an idol, a very idol, a fierce and rank idol, and thou, the Nebuchadnezzar, the proud Nebuchadnezzar of the fair that settest it up for children to fall down to and worship. Christ, mercy, sir. Will you buy a fiddle to fill up your noise? <laughs> look, Gwen, do look and save thy longing. Here be fine sights. Yes, and you may, as our brother Sino does, you may look on it. But what say you to a drum, sir? Is the broken belly of the beast, and thy bellows there are as long as these, these pipes, or his throat, uh, thy, thy, thy feathers are of his tail, and thy rattles the gnashing of his teeth. And what is my gingerbread, I pray you? The provender that pricks him up, hence with thy basket of potpourri, thy, thy nest of images, and whole legend of ginger work. Sir, do you not be quiet the quicker? I should have thee clapped fairly by the heels for disturbing the thing. The sin of the fair provokes me. I cannot be silent. Good brother Seal, I will make you silent, believe it. I would give you a shilling if you could, in faith. <laughs> give me that shilling. And I will leave you, give you my shot if I do not, and I'll keep it in the meantime. A match, but do it quickly then. Hinder me not, woman. I was moved in spirit to be here on this day, in this fair, this wicked and foul fair, and bitter it may be called a foul than a fair, to protest against the abuses of it, the foul abuses of it, in regard of the afflicted saints who are troubled, very much troubled, by the opening of the merchandise in Babylon again, here, here in the high places. See you not Goldilocks, the purple strumpet there in her yellow gown and green sleeves, the profane pipes, the tinkling timbrels, a shop of relics. I pray you forbear and put in trust with them. And this idolatrous throne of images, which I pull down! <laughs> Sir, there do make no doubt that you are officers. Uh, 
What then, sir? And the king's loving and obedient servant. Obedient, friend? Take heed what you speak, I advise you. Olive Bristle advises you. His loving subjects we grant you, but not his obedient at this time. By your leave, we know ourselves a little better than so. We are to command, sir, and such as you are to be obedient. Here is one of his obedient subjects going to the stocks, and we will make you one such another if you talk. You are all wise enough to your places, I know. If you know it, sir, why do you bring it in question? Pardon me, I don't question anything. I only hope that you have warrant for what you do, and so could you. What is he? Bring him up to the stocks here. If you have had an overdue warrant, it is well you are safe. For that is the warrant of warrants, and I would not give this button for any man's warrant else. Oh, what is he that doth so esteem and advance my warrant? He seems a sober and discreet fellow, and a comfort to a good conscience to be followed with good fame in his suffering. The world will have a pretty taste by this. How I can bear adversity, and will begin a kind of reverence toward me hereafter. But when they see I can c carry my calamity nobly, and that it doth neither break nor bend. Come, sir, here is a place for you to preach in. Put in your leg. That I will, cheerfully. On my conscience, a seminary. He kisses the stocks. Well, my masters, I will leave him here with you. I see him bestowed. Oh, I'll go look for my goods and nuts. You may, sir. I warrant you. <laughs> and, and where's the other bowler? Fetch him, too. You shall find them both fast enough. In the midst of this tumult, I will yet remain the author of mine own rest and, not minding their fury, sit in the stocks. In that hall, I shall be able to trouble a triumph. Do you show me that you have warrant for what you do? What is this fellow, for God's sake? Do you but show me Adam overdue, and I am satisfied. <laughs> he is one that is distracted, they say, one trouble all. He was an officer at the court of pie powder here last year and put out of his place by Justice Overdue. Upon which he took an idle conceit and has run mad upon it, so that ever since he will do nothing but by justice overdue's warrant. He will not eat a crust, nor drink a little, nor make him in his apparel ready. His wife cannot get him make his water, <laughs> nor shift his shirt without his warrant. If this be true, this is my greatest disaster. How am I bound to satisfy this poor man that is of so good a nature to me out of his wits? If you cannot show me Adam Overdue's warrant, I am in doubt of you. It must leave. Before me, neighbor Bristol, and now I think of it better, Justice Overdue is a very imperatory person. Oh, are you advised of that? And a severe justicer by your leave. Do I hear ill on that side too? <laughs> He, he will sit as upright on the bench, if you mark him, as a candle in the socket, and bring light to the whole court in every business. But he will burn blue and swell like a boil. God bless us, if he be angry. Aye, and he will be angry too, when he list. That is more. And when he is angry, be it right or wrong, he has the law on his side over. I mark that too. I will be more tender hereafter. I see compassion may become a justice, though, though it is a weakness and nearer a vice than a virtue. Well, take him out of the stocks again. We will go a short way to work. We will have the ace of hearts on our side if we can. Ah, oh, pull your fellow there. Master busy pulling your legs, I hope, but we cannot rule your tongue. No, minister of the darkness, no. Thou canst not rule my tongue. My tongue, it is mine own, and with it I will both knock and mock down your Bartholomew abominations till you be made a hissing to the neighbor parishes round about. Let him alone. We have devised better ones. Shall he not into the stocks then? No, mistress. We will have him over to justice overdue, and he will do over them as is fitting. Ugh. Then Bless I you. and my gossip haggis and my beetle butcher are discharged. Bless you, honest women. Nay, never thank us, but uh, thank this madman that comes here. He put it in our heads. Is he mad? <laughs> well, heaven increase his madness and bless it and thank it. Sir, your forehead may thank you. Where is your warrant? <laughs> I have a warrant out of the word to give thanks.
thanks for removing any scorn intended towards the brethren. If you have not Adam Overdue's warrant, then you shall keep your word and I will keep mine. Come away, Nightingale, I'm ready. With it go you, where's your warrant? Warrant? For what, sir? For what you go about. If you have not a warrant, bless you. I will pray for you, that is all I can do. <laughs> what? What means he? Madman that haunts the fair. You don't know him. Be sure of him, he startled me. I thought he'd known of our plot. Have you prepared the costume on her? Yes. She is at the corner here, ready. And your prize, he comes down sailing that way, all alone, without his protector. He's rid of her, it seems. I know. I, uh, I should have followed her protectorship for a feat I am to do upon her only. This offered itself so in the way that I could not let it escape. Here he comes. Oh, by this light, I cannot find my gingerbread wife or my hobby horse woman in all the fair to get my money back. And I do not know the way out of it to go home for more. Uh, do you hear, friend? Uh, you that whistle. What tune is that you whistle? Oh, a new tune I'm practicing, sir. Does not know where I dwell? I do not myself. I will be sworn. Uh, I have no such hate for an answer. On with thy tune, I'll practice with thee. Source? 
slut. We love you. If you both love me as you pretend, your own reason will tell you but one can enjoy me. And at that point, there leads a direct alignment by my own infamy, which must follow if you fight. It is true. I have professed it to you ingenuously that rather than be yoked with this bridegroom who's appointed me, I would take up any husband, almost upon any trust. The subtlety would say to me, I know he is a fool, he has an estate, and I might govern him and enjoy a friend beside. But these are not my aims. I must have a husband, I must love, or else I cannot live with him. I shall ill make one of these politic wives. Why, if you can like either of us, lady, say which is he, and the other will swear instantly to desist. Content, I accord to that willingly. Sure, you think me a woman of extreme levity, gentlemen, or a strange fancy, that by meeting you here in a place like this, both at the same instant, not yet two hours acquaintance, neither of you deserving afford the other. I shall force us, I should so forsake my modesty, though I might affect one more particularly, as to say, this is he, and name him. Why, wherefore should you not? What should hinder you? If you will not give it to my modesty, allow it yet to my wit. Give me so much woman and cunning as to not betray myself impertinently. How can I judge of you so far as to a choice without knowing you more? You are both alike and equal to me yet, and, and so indifferently affected by me. This speech of you might be the man if not the way. For you are a reasonable creature. You have understanding and discourse, and if fate send me an understanding husband, I have no fear at all that mine own matters shall make him a good one. Would I were put forth to making for you then? It may be you are. Would you consent to a motion of mine, gentlemen? Whatever it be, we will presume reasonableness coming from you. And fitness, too. I saw one of you buy a pair of tables even now. Yes, here they be, and maiden ones too, unwritten. The fitter for what they may be employed in. You shall write either of you a word or a name what you like best, but two or three syllables at most. And the next person that comes this way, because Destiny plays a high hand in business of this nature, I shall ask which of the two words he or she doth approve. And according to that sentence, fix my resolution and affection without change. Agree, my word is conceived already. And mine, shall not be long creating after. <laughs> but you must promise me, gentlemen, not to be curious which of you it is taken. But give me leave to conceal that until you have brought me either home or where I may safely tender myself. Why, that is but equal. We are pleased. Because I will bind both of your efforts to work together jointly and friendly, each to the other's fortune, and have myself fitted with some amends to make he that is forsaken a part of amends. These conditions are very courteous. Well, my word is out of the Arcadia, then. Argalus. And mine, out of the play. Palemon. Where is your warrant? There must be a warrant had, gentlemen, believe it. <laughs> For what? For whatever it is you go about, anything at all, no matter what. But here's a fine ragged prophet. Pardon me, gentlemen. I say, stay a little. Good lady, put him to the question. You are content, then? Yes. Yes. Sir, here are two names written. It's just as over to one of them. How? Sir, I, I pray you read them to yourself, sir. It is for a wager between these two gentlemen. And with a stroke or any difference, mark what you like best. These may be worshipful names for aught I know, but I assure you, that Justice Overdue's name is worth three of them. I pray you like one of them, sir. How do I bow that is the best warrant? To stave your longing, it shall be. Yes. But I am for Justice Overdue. That is my conscience. 
<laughs> Is it done, lady? I am strangely as I ever saw. What the hell is this? No matter what a fortune teller we have made them. Which is it? Which is it? Nay. Did you not promise not to inquire? Slid, I forgot that for you. Pardon me. Look, here is our Mercury Pump. The license arrives in the finest time, too. It is but scraping out Cox's name, and it's done. How now, Lime Tree? Hast thou touched? Not yet, sir. Except you would go with me and see it. It is not worth speaking on. The act is nothing without witness. Here comes your woman, fallen into the finest company, Captain Wick, that helps Captain Jordan to roar. I will undertake to gelder for you, I pray you. Come away and see it. Slight, I will not lose it for the fair. What will you do, Ned? If I stay here about for you, Mistress Wellborn must not be seen. Do so, and find out a priest in the meantime. I will bring the license. Me, which way? <laughs> here, sir, you may hear the noise. Sweet face. Oh. 
heart that melancholy, a little distempered at this <laughs> enormity. And treat a courtesy of you, Captain. And treat a hundred velvet women, and I would do it. I cannot with modesty speak of it. I will do it. Ursula! Hell no, rascal! What roar you for? Ill pimp. Come now, Ernest. Bring this good, brave woman to a Jordan, if it be. So I'd call you Captain Jordan to her, can you not? Nay, Prithee, leave thy conceits, Urs, and bring this woman to <gasps> the... Oh, I bring her? Hang her? <laughs> Heart, must I find a common pot for every punk in your pearly ooze? Nay, Urs, this is a guest of the velvet, in faith. Let her sell her hood and buy a sponge with a pox to her. My, uh, vessel is employed, madam. I have but one, and it is the bottom of an old bottle. An honest proctor and his wife are even added within. <laughs> if she will stay her time, so. As soon as thou canst, sweet furs. <laughs> I'm not wit, stealing your leaps, covering in corners, huh? <laughs> no, my faith, Captain. I was procuring a small courtesy for a woman of fashion here. <laughs> oh, Captain, <laughs> though I am just as a beast's wife, I do love soldiers and the children of the sword when they come before my husband. <laughs> Sayest thou so, Philly? <laughs> thou shalt have a leap presently. I will horse thee myself, thus. <laughs> ah, will you bring her in and let her take her turn? Grand mercy, good Urs, I thank thee. The master of Verdu shall thank her. <laughs> a good gammer Urs, a win and I are exceedingly beholden to you and to Captain Jordan and to Captain Whit. When I will be so bold as to leave you in this good company for a half hour or so while I go see how my matter goes forward, if the puppets be perfect, and then I will return and fetch you. Will you leave me alone with these two strangers, George? Oh, I, they are honest, Wynn. Captain Jordan and Captain Whit will use you very civilly. Got me with you, Wynn! <laughs> Is her husband gone? On his false gallopers away. If you be true, Bartholomew Bird, show yourselves so now. We are undone for want of a foul in the fair. Here will be Ezekiel Edgeworth with three or four gallons with her at night, and I have neither plover nor quail for him. Persuade this between you to become a bird of the game. Well, as I work the velvet woman within. I can see the ears. Go thy ways. Dost thou hear, wit? Is it not pity that my delicate, dark chestnut here should lead a dull, honest woman's life that might live the life of a lady? By my faith and troth, Captain, it is. The honest woman's life is a dull, scurvy life indeed. How, madam, is an honest woman's life a scurvy life? Yes, faith, sweetheart, the life of a bond woman. But if thou wilt hearken to me, I will make thee a free woman and a lady to ride in a coach, sup with gallants, see the players, be drunk, and lie by twenty of them if thou please, sweetheart. What? And be honest still? That were fine sport. It is common, sweetheart. It shall be justified to thy husband's face. Thou shalt be as honest as the skin between his horns. <laughs> it is the spirit in the wife to cuckold nowadays, as it is the fashion in the husband not to suspect. Lord, what a fool I have been! Men then, do everything like a lady hereafter. Never know thy husband from another man. Nor any one man from another, but in the dark. Aye, and then it is no sin to know any man at all. Help! 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 <laughs> we are home now. <laughs> Yonder's your punk of Turnbull. Rapping Alice has fallen upon the poor gentle one within. <laughs> Take our trade from us with your tough taffeta. 
Bridewell. I buy the same token you ran back me and broke out the bottom of the cart, Night Top. Why, lion face? Do you know who I am? Shall I tear rough, slit waistcoat, make rags of petticoat? Huh? Go to. Vanish. <laughs> Come, brave woman, take a good heart. Thou shalt be a lady too. Ursula, take them in, open thy wardrobe, and fit them to their calling. The green gowns, crimson petticoats, <laughs> guest of the game, true bread. By what warrant does it say so? You know I can't drink without a warrant. Slug, it will not stale without a warrant presently. Wit, give me pen, ink, and paper. I shall draw him a warrant presently. It must be Justice Overdose. <clears throat> I know, man. Fetch the drink, Wit. I prithee be brief, Captain. The new ladies stay for thee. Oh, as brief as can be. Here it is already. Adam Overdue. circumstances concur. I do think how importantly I labor. If the name be not mine, that the ragged fellow marked. But what advantage I've given Ned Winwife in this time now of working her, though it be mine. He will go near to form to her what a debauched rascal I am and fright her out of all the conceit of me. I should do so by him, I'm sure, if I had the opportunity. I would give by my troth now all I could spare to be my tattered suits here again. To know certainly whose name he has damned or saved. I must seek him out. Who be these? Sir, you are a cold and a pretend burnt a new constable! You say very well. Come, um, put her leg in the middle, Roundel. How oh, now, now? No matter how, pray you look off. Nay, I'll not offend you, Nums. I thought you had sat there to be seen. And to be sold too, did you not? Pray you mind your own business if you have any. What should he say, or where should he say? He is not to be found. He has not been seen in the fair here all this live long day. There is no court of pie powders yet. <laughs> what shall be done with them then, in your turn? I think it were best we put them in the stocks so his worship come. Come, madam, here is company for you. Heave up the stocks. I shall put your trick upon your dungeon. Put in your legs, sir. Come, the lion may roar, but he cannot bite. I am glad to be put apart in the stocks and separated from the whole the heathen of the land for the holy cause. What are you, sir? But one that rejoiceth in his affliction and sitteth here to prophesy the destruction of bears and maygains, wakes and wits and ales, and doth sigh and groan for the reformation of these abuses. And do you sigh and groan too, or rejoice in your affliction? I, I do not think of it. I do not feel it. It is a thing without me, Adam, that would above these batteries and contumelies. Look you, a device for shifting in a hand for a foot. <laughs> God be with you. Wilt thou then leave thy brethren in the stocks? But this one, sir. Thou art a whole neutral. Then stop her there. Stay her that will not endure the heat of persecution. 
in. How? What is the matter? She has fled. She has fled and dares not sit it out. What? Has she made an escape? Which way? Follow me, Brian. <laughs> oh, me in the stocks. Have the wicked prevail. In peace, religious sister. It is my calling, an extraordinary calling, and done for my better standing. My surer standing here at. By whose warrant this? Oh, here's my man I look for. Good sir, they have set the faithful here to be wondered at and made homes for the holy of the land. <laughs> Showed they warrant? Showed they Adam over Jews hand? If they shall not, they shall answer for it. Sure, you do not lock the stock sufficiently, neighbor. No, see if you can lock them better. They are very sufficiently locked, and truly, yet something is the matter. True, it is your warrant that is the matter. Show your warrant to me. Madman, hold your peace. I will put you in her room else, in the very same hole, do you see? Oh, is she a madman? Do show me Adam Overdue, I will obey you. You are a mad fool, hold your tongue. Poor wretch, how it hurts my heart for him. He be mad is vain to question him. Old trial. Frank, there was a gentleman who showed you two names, some hours since. Argus and Palamon. Mark them both. Which of them was it you marked? I marked no name but Adam Overdue. For that is the name of names and the only magistrate that I reverence. <coughs> this fellow is mad indeed. And for a draw for another four. I shall not breathe in peace till I have made him some amends. Well, I will make another use of him then. I have a nest of beards in my trunk, one something like this. This mad fool has made me that I know not whether I lock the stocks or no. I think I locked them. severity yet come, wherein I shall reveal myself. Cloud. I shall break out in rain and hail, thunder and lightning upon the head of enormity. Uh, two main matters I must prosecute first. Uh, one is to invent some means of satisfaction for that poor wretch that is out of his wits for my sake. And yonder I see him coming. <laughs> I wonder where Tom Corliss is, that he returns not. Is he, could, he could be struck in here to seek us somewhere. Say, here's our madman again. I have made myself as like him as his gown and cap will give me leave. Good <laughs> sir, I love you and wish to be mad with you in truth. How, my widow in love with a madman? <laughs> I can be as mad and spirit as you. 
by whose word leave your chanting. Gentlemen, have I found you? Where is your book? It was a sufficient name I marked. Let me see it. Be not afraid to show it me. What would you with it, sir? Mark it again and again at your service. Here it is, sir. This was that you marked. Palamon. Fare you well, fare you well. How, Palamon? He has discovered it to you, and therefore it would be vain to disguise it any longer. I am yours, sir, by the benefit of your fortune. And you have him, mistress, believe it, that should never give you cause to repent her benefit. I desire to put no danger of protestation. Palamon the word and you like the man. Sir, thou save a young fellow in your madness. Shall not one of the sanctified sisters who would draw with you in truth. Where from my heart, a hypocritical, proud ignorance, rather wild and mad, fitter for woods and a society of beasts and hogs and a congregation of men. Let me alone. I'll look the word and midwife the man. I must uncover myself to him, or I will never enjoy him for all the cunning men's promises. <laughs> Sir, I am worth six thousand pounds. <laughs> My love for you has become my rack. I will tell you all and the truth. These seven years I have been a willful holy widow, only to draw feasts and gifts from my entangled suitors. I am also an assisting sister of the deacons, and a devourer instead of a distributor of the alms. I am also a special maker of marriages for our decayed brethren with our rich widows, for a third part of their wealth. As for our poor, handsome young virgins with our wealthy bachelors, and have, have them steal from their husbands when I have confirmed them in the faith and got all put into their custodies. Our elder, zeal of the land, would have had me, but I know him to be a capital knave of the land. And so, having uttered my heart with the tongue of love, take all my deceits together, I beseech you. I would not have told you this except that I think you are mad and hope you would think me so too, sir. Stand aside, I will answer you presently. Why should I not marry the six thousand pound now I think of it? And a good trade too, she is besides, huh? The other wench windwife is sure of, there is no expectation for me there. It is money that I want, why should I not marry the money when it is offered me? I have a license at all, it's but raising on one name and putting in another. Well, come your ways, follow me. If you will be mad, I will show you a one. Oh, zealously is that I zealously desire. Well, uh, sir, let me speak with you. By whose word? By the warrant you do so tender and admire. Justice overdue. I am the man, friend, trouble all, though thus disguised as the careful magistrate ought, for the good of the Republic and the weeding out of enormity. Uh, do you want to? A house, or, or clothes, or, or drink, or meat? Uh, what want you? Nothing but your warrant. My warrant for what? To be gone, sir. Uh, and nay, I pray thee stay. I, I have not many words, nor such time to exchange with thee. Think on what may do thee good. Why, your hand and seal will do me a great deal of good. Nothing else in the whole fair. That I know. Thou shouldst have it willingly, if it were to any end. Why, it will satisfy me. It is end enough to look on. If you will not give it me, let me go. Uh, alas, uh, thou shalt have it willingly. I will look, step into the scriveners hereby. Do not go away. But this madman's shape will prove a very fortunate one, I think. <laughs> if he be the wise justice and he bring me his hand, I shall go near and make some use on it. Hmm. Oh, he's come already. Here, see my hand and seal, Adam overdue. <clears throat> Look you on it, if there be anything written above it that thou wants now or at any time hereafter, think on it, and, and it shall be yours. Can your friend here write? A hand for a witness, and all is well. See, here I deliver it as my deed again. Let us now proceed in madness. My conscience is much eased. Adam hath offered satisfaction, though it doth him little good, but I have made amends. Poor wretch, he is much affected by his affliction, brings him low. 
Now on to my second matter, which is uh, to reduce that woman I have followed so long from the brink of her bane to the center of safety. Here or in some such like vain place, I am sure to find her. Uh, friend, our fellow master of the monument. It is motion, if it please your My fantastical brother-in-law, Bartholomew Cox. Uh, motion, well, what is that? The ancient modern history of Hero and Lander, otherwise known as the touchstone of true love. A uh, pretty in faith, but uh, what, what is the meaning of it? Is it an interlude, or what is it? Yes, sir, please you come here. I will take your money with it. Sir, you must pay, sir, if you go in. Who, uh, I? I perceive thou knowest not me. Uh, call the mistress of the motion. What, do you not know the author, fellow Mooncap? You must take no money of him. He must come in gratis. Please speak not too loud. I would not have any notice taken that I am the author to him. See how it passes. <laughs> Master Littlewit, how dost thou? Uh, Master Coates, we're exceedingly well met. Oh, without a cloak or a hat? Oh, I have lost all in the fair and my acquaintance too. Didst thou meet anybody I know, Master Littlewit? My woman Nuts, or Mistress Grace, or my sister? Oh, pretty, Master Littlewit. Lend me some money to see the interlude here? I will pay thee again, as I am an honest gentleman. If thou wilt but carry me home, I have money there. Oh, sir, you shall command it. Oh, will the crown serve you? Uh, I think it will. Uh, what, what is the price for coming in, madam? Two pence, sir. Two pence? Well, there is twelve pence, friend. <laughs> Nay, I am a gallant, simple as I appear now, if you see me about with my woman and my artillery again. Uh, your woman was in the stocks even now, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes, babe. For what in faith, I am glad of that. <laughs> uh, what manner of matter is this, Master Littlewit? What kind of actors do you have? Are they good actors? Oh, free to you, sir. Uh, all children, both old and young. Here is the mistress of them. But call me not Leatherhead, but Lantern. Mistress Lantern, that uh, brings light to the proceedings? <laughs> Uh, I would like to meet the young company, the actors. I would fain drink with them. Which is the tiring house? Troth, sir, our tiring house is somewhat little. <laughs> pray, we are but beginners. Pray pardon us. You cannot go upright in it. <laughs> what? Not now that my hat is off? What would you have done with me as I was, feather and all, once today? Let me see your actors. Show him them. Show him them. This is a gentleman that is a favor of the highest quality. Uh, the favoring of this licentious quality is a consumption of many a young gentleman, a pernicious enormity. What? Do they live in baskets? They do lie in a basket, sir. They are of the small players. <laughs> do you call these players? Well, they are actors, sir. Well, as good as any for dumb shows. Well, which is your verbiage now? What mean you by that, sir? <laughs> Which is your best actor? This is he, young Leander. <laughs> he is well beloved of the womankind. They do so affect his action. And this is lovely Hero, as you shall see in all. Oh, they are a civil company indeed. They do not offer to fleer, nor jeer, nor break jest, as the great players are wont to do. And there goes not so much to the cost of feeding them or making them drunk because of their littleness. <laughs> I do say they are a well-governed company by my industry and policy. Oh, uh, but I mean, do you play according to the printed book? Oh, by no means, sir. Well, well, how then? A better way. That is too learned and poetical for our audience. What do they know what hell spot is? <laughs> Thou art in the right. I do not know myself. I have entreated Master Littlewit to take a little pains to reduce it to a more familiar strain for our people. <clears throat> How I pray thee, Master Littlewit. I've only made it a little easier and modern for the times, that's all. As for the hell spot, I imagine our tens here. And Leander, I make a dire son about Puddle Wharf. And Hero, a wench of the bankside, who, going over one morning to Old Fish Street, 
Leander spies her land at tree stairs and falls in love with her. Then I do introduce Cupid, who, having metamorphosed himself into a drawer, strikes you in love with a pint of sherry and other pretty passages there are that will please you and delight your good judgments. I will be sworn they shall. <laughs> Look, yonder is your coach, gotten in among his playfellows. I thought we could not miss him at such a spectacle. Let him alone. He's so busy, he won't never spy us. Nay, good sir. <laughs> what? Oh, I wasn't going to hurt her. What? Dost thou think me uncivil? <laughs> Pray, be not jealous. I'm toward a wife. Well, Mistress Lantern, make you ready to begin, that I might fetch my wife and look you. Be perfect, else you undo me in my reputation. I warrant you, sir. Read not too great an expectation of it amongst your friends. That's the only hurt of these things. No, no, no. My mistress Grace, in the company of a stranger, I shall be compelled to reveal myself before my time. Two pence apiece, gentlemen. An excellent motion. <laughs> Here is my care come. I like to see her in such good company, yet I wonder that persons of such fashion should resort to her. This is a very private house, madam. Will it please your ladyship to sit, madam? Do you so all madam me? I think they can be a very lady. But what else, madam? Must I go out and ask to her? Oh, by no means. Well, how would my husband know me then? Husband? He must not know you, nor you him. Yeah, I will more of this. Is this a lady friend? Yes, faith, sweetheart, and that is another lady. <laughs> if thou hast a mind to them, give me 12 pence from thee, and thou shalt have either one of them. Hey, well, this will prove my cheapest enormity yet. I will follow this. Is this not a finer life, lady, than to be clogged with a husband? Oh, yes, a great deal. Why don't they begin the motion? Oh, by and by, madam, they stay but for no <coughs> Do you hear, puppet mistress? When begin you? Uh, we wait but for Master Littlewit, who has gone for his wife. Oh, that is us! That is us! It was you! <laughs> lady, but now you are no such poor thing. How now, friend? What is here to do? Two cents apiece, madam. The best motion in the fair. I believe you lie. If you do, I will have my money again and beat you. Youngsters, <laughs> come. Oh, did you see a young squire of mine come in here, Master Bartholomew Coates? I think there is a woman then. Look, he be you were best, but it is very likely. I wonder I found him not at all the rest. I have been at the eagle and the black wolf and the bull with five legs and two pizzles and the Dogs that danced to Morris and the hair of the tabor and missed him at all these. I'm sure this must needs be some fine sight that holds him if it have him. Come, are you ready now? Presently, sir. Boy day, what do you hear, sir? Hold thy peace, nuns. Thou hast been in the stocks, I hear. <gasps> Does he know that? Nay, then the date of my authority is out. I must no longer think to reign. My government is at an end. He that corrects another must find fault in himself. Sure, Master Littlewood will not come. Pray, madam, please take a seat. We are about to begin. Yes, please do, my eyes long to be in it, and my ears too. Oh, numbs in the stocks, numbs! I pray you intend your game, sir. Let me alone. We are quick for all, then. Come, sit by me. I will interpret to thee. Did you see Mistress Grace? Now that I think of it, neither. Tell me a moment. A great deal of love and care he expresses. Alas, would you have him express more than he already has? How charity. <coughs> Gentle, that no longer your expectations may wander, behold our chief actor, Amorous Lian. <laughs> With a great deal of cloth lapped about him like a scarf, for he yet serves his father 
a dyer at Puddle Wharf. Now he's beating to make the dye take the fuller. Who chances to come by but fair hero in a sculler <laughs> who spying Leander's naked leg and goodly oh, cow <laughs> cast at him from the boat a sheep's eye and a half. <laughs> now she is landed and the sculler come back. By and by you shall see what Leander doth lack. <laughs> Oh, fear not, my gander, I do protest. 
I should handle my matters very ill if I had not a whole candle. Well, then look to it and kiss me to boot. <laughs> now, here comes old Cole back from the river, and under his cloak, a pouch full of silver. I draw a of some wine here. Some wine there, sir? There is company already. Pray for bear. What is here? What is here? Kiss, kiss upon kiss. Why, what harm is in this? It is a lovely hero. Mistress Hero is a whore. <gasps> is she a whore? Sir, keep you quiet. Knave out of door. Knave out of door? Yes, knave out of door. Whore out of door. I say knave out of door. I say whore out of door. <laughs> Kiss the whore on the arse. <laughs> Or the confect maker, your French fashion! 
Sena! You would have all the sin within your sight. Would you not? Would you not? No, Dave. What then, Dagonet? Is a puppet worse than these? Yes, and my chief argument against you is that you are an abomination. For that the male amongst you putteth on the apparel of the female, and the female of the male. You lie! You lie! You lie abominably! Uh, good! By my troth, he has given him life thrice. It is your own stale argument against the players, but it will not hold against the puppets. For we have neither male nor female amongst us. And that thou may see if thou wilt, like the malicious zeal that thou art! <laughs> Confuted. Ah! <laughs> Boss has failed. And be converted. Be converted. Be converted. <laughs> be converted. I pray you and let the play go on. Let it go on. <laughs> I'm changed and will become a beholder with you. Thou hast a brave and faith thou hast carried on. On with the play. I charge you, I am overdue! My father in law! My guardian? The test is overdue? It is time to take an orbity by the forehead and brand it! For I am discovered enough! <sighs> Nay, come, mistress bride, you must do as I do now. You must be mad with me in truth. I have here just this overdue. Fine. Uh, come hither, friend Trouble Law, and thou shalt trouble none. I will take charge of you and of your friend here. Uh, you also, young lady, will be in my care. Uh, come, uh, stand you there. Have mercy upon me. Would we were away with these be dangerous vapors. Best fall off with our birds, we'll feel at the cage. Stay! Is not my name thy terror? Yes, faith, man, and it is for that that we would be gone. <laughs> oh, gentlemen, did you not see my wife? I have lost my little wife, my pretty little whim. I left her in trust at the great woman's house yonder, the pink woman's, with Captain Jordan and Captain Witt, very excellent women, and now I cannot hear of her. Oh, mother, did you not see whim? If this grave matron be your mother, stand you by her. I may perhaps bring a wife for you and on. Brother Bartholomew, I am sadly sorry to see you so lightly given, such a disciple of enormity. Your grave governess, stand you both there, in the middle place. I will reprimand you in your course. <clears throat> now, Mistress Grace, allow me to rescue you from the hands of the stranger. Pardon me, sir. I am a kinsman of hers. Are you so? Of what name, sir? Winwife, sir. Master Winwife. I hope you have won no wife of her, sir. If you have, I will consider the possibility of it at fit leisure. Now, on to my enormities. Look upon me, O London. Mark me the example of justice and the mirror of magistrates, the true top of formality and scourge of enormity. Look upon me. Hark unto my discoveries, and compare Hercules with me, if thou darest. <laughs> or Columbus, or Magellan, or our countryman Drake of later times. <clears throat> Stand forth, you weeds of enormity, and spread. First, thou, reverend busy, thou super-lunatical hypocrite. Next. Thou other extremity, profane professor of puppetry, little better than poetry. And thou, seducer and debaucher of youth, witness this easy and honest young woman. <laughs> and thou, esquire of dames, madams, and twelve penny ladies. And thou, my green madam herself of the price 
Let me unmask your ladyship. Oh, my wife. My wife. My wife! Is she your wife? By your leave, stand by and be uncovered! Say him! Say him! <laughs> Cry, Blue Cat! My pair! My pair! Yes, and I fear no man but Adam Overdue! What is the matter? He is stolen again Ursula's pair! Ursula? Oh, the sow of enormity, this! Welcome! Stand you there! And it please your worship, I am in no fault! A gentleman stripped him in my booth, borrowed his coat and his hat, and he ran away with my goods there for it! Then thou art the true madman! And thou art the enormity! <sighs> you are in the right, sir. I am mad from the gown outward. Stand you there, where you please. Oh, oh, let me basin. I am sick. I, I am sick. in her. I thank you, sir, for the gift of your award, Mistress Grace. Here is your hand and seal, by the way. Master Winwife, give you joy. You are Palamon. You are possessive of the general woman, but she must pay me value. Here is warrant for it. <laughs> and, honest man, man, there is thy gown and cap again. I thank thee for my wife. Nay, I can be mad, sweetheart, when I please. Still, never fear you. And careful nuns, where is she? I thank her for my license. How? And it's true, nuns. Well, I'll be hanged there. Look in your box, nuns. Sir, stand not too fixed there, like the whipping post in the fair, but get your wife out of the air. It will make her worse else. And remember, you are but Adam. Flesh and blood, you have your frailty. Forget your other name of overdue and invite us all to supper. There you and I will compare our discoveries and drown the memory of all enormity in your biggest bowl at home. What nums, hast thou not it? I warrant it was when you were in the stocks. <laughs> what? Say nothing. We will never speak again for aught I know. Nay, if I be patient, uh, you all must be so too. This pleasant and conceited young gentleman hath wrought upon my judgment and prevailed. I pray thee, my good friends all. And no enormities. I would like to invite you all to my home for supper. And I would have no man need fear come, for my intents are correction, not destruction. So lead on. Yes, yes. And bring the actors along. We will have the rest of the 